Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name's Robert and I'm going to do a Friday Reads update today. Uh, I'm experimenting a little bit with uh, lighting, with microphones, with using my iPhone instead of my other camera. Um, so if anything looks good, bad, or indifferent, all creative help is appreciated because I'm really struggling with the whole idea of lighting and backgrounds and things like that. Um, it's a good week reading. I finished three books. Um, I didn't love all of them, but they were all interesting in their own way. Uh, and so I'll take you through those three and then I'll tell you what's ahead for me for this weekend. The first book I finished is a booktube internet darling, and that's Sarah Perry's new book, Melmoth. Uh, if you don't know anything about the story, uh, it's based on an old book, uh, Mel an old story, Melmoth the Wanderer, um, where basically someone sells their soul to the devil. It's somewhat like a Faust story, but Sarah Perry changes it quite a bit. And first of all, she puts it from a more feminist perspective because Melmoth is a, is a female presence or character in this book. But we start off the book with um, Helen Franklin, who is English. But she, and this is not a spoiler, she tells you this right, right from the beginning, she's living in Prague kind of like in self-exile. But we have no idea what she's done that makes her feel like she should be in self-exile. And she's punishing herself. She's living in kind of a Spartan existence. And she's working as a translator, I believe. I forget if that's correct, but I think that's right. And she befriends a... Um, professor at this library where she does a lot of work. His name is Carell. And he turns her onto this story and gives her a bunch of documents about Melmoth the Wanderer. Melmoth is a, a story from mythology, from biblical history, that is supposed to be a witness that she follows around people who have done heinous things and she kind of acts as an evil conscience in some ways. And anyway, so the, the rest of the book, and it's hard to describe this book without giving away too much, and so I'm not going to do that. But the rest of this book is Helen learning more about Melmoth, learning more about some of her friends in Prague, and reading some of these historical documents that have to do with Melmoth. Um, I was not a huge fan of this book, and I know that's going to be an unpopular opinion and I'm going to lose subscribers, but I think a lot of people on Goodreads are giving this five stars because they love The Essex Serpent so much. And I like The Essex Serpent too. It was a solid four star read for me. This one, I didn't think it was as successful because I think Sarah Perry is playing some pretty manipulative tricks to keep suspense high. Um, in what's supposed to be some kind of a gothic story. And I didn't find it all particularly suspenseful. I found it kind of distracting and frustrating where she'll develop something and hint at something and hint at something and then disappear for 120 pages and then come back to it later and maybe develop it, maybe it not. There are some things that I finished this book and still didn't know exactly what they referred to. Um, so for me, it wasn't as successful as The Essex Serpent. She has a wonderful Victorian style of prose that is always impressive, but the actual structure and story of Melmoth was to me somewhat disappointing. So for me, it was a three-star read. And I did this one as a buddy read with um, Jacqueline of Six Minutes for Me, Doris of All the Books, and Kendra Winchester, and even the four of us had varied opinions. Jacqueline and I, weren't really that fond of it. Doris absolutely adores the book um, and Kendra was traveling so she hasn't given us her final um, way in yet but it sounds like she has some questions about it and doesn't feel like it was as good as The Essex Serpent either but I'll let her speak to that. The second book I finished was um, a nonfiction book. It's called Notes on a Foreign Country and American Abroad in a Post-American World by Susie Hansen. Susie Hansen is a young journalist. She was making quite a name for herself working for a, a big uh, New York newspaper. And 
in the post 9-11 world, in the post Iraq invasion world, she wanted to know what it really was like to understand the Muslim world. And so she decided to move to Istanbul, Turkey. And she did. Um, everybody thought she was crazy. Um, her family thought she was crazy, but she kind of fell in love with the country. But she very quickly realized that she doesn't understand America's own history in relation to other countries. She knew what everybody else knows about American history, which is what we're taught in school, but we're not taught much about our close relationships with other countries, uh, which aren't all that flattering at times. And so over the next decade of her living in Istanbul and a lot of things going on in the Middle East with the Arab Spring and so on, she learns quite a bit about the Middle East, but also learns a lot about herself and about her naivete, her innocence, her misconceptions about both the Middle East and about the United States. This book is really beautifully written. It's complicated and it's a hard read because you always have to concentrate. There's so much going on. There's so many names involved. There's so many countries involved. It's not an easy read, but it's a fascinating read because she is very quick to point out that she had so many misguided conceptions that she learned about in her experience and that she quickly had to set aside what she thought she knew about the United States. One of the things that she learned that was really interesting is that most people around the world separate United States citizens with the United States government. They realize that the citizens don't even know a lot of what's going on um, sponsored by the government. And that's probably the biggest thing that she learned. I want to read to you, I'm gonna have to go get the book. I left it over on the other counter. I want to read to you a little bit of the very last page. Hang on, I'll be right back. I guess I'll actually have to edit that. Okay, I wanna to read to you just a paragraph and a half from the last page of her epilogue uh, to kind of show you what she got out of the experience. It's common to say Watergate shattered American innocence, that Vietnam shattered American innocence, that September 11 shattered American innocence, that Trump shattered American innocence. But this was all wishful thinking. American innocence never dies. That pain in my heart is my innocence. The only difference is that now I know it. If there was anything fully shattered during my years abroad, it was faith in my own objectivity as a journalist or as a human being. And then I'm gonna to skip to the final paragraph. Why do we become, or excuse me, who do we become if we don't become Americans? We are benevolent and ordinary and we are terrible things too. We are missionaries and oil speculators, racists and soldiers, bureaucrats and financiers, occupiers and invaders, hope mongers and hypocrites. The American dream was to create our own destiny, but it's perhaps an ethical duty as a human being and as an American to consider that our American dreams may have come at the expense of a million other destinies. To deny that is to deny the realities of millions of people and to forever sever ourselves from humanity. I went abroad for the same reason everyone else does, to learn how to live. Whoever Americans become after this time of reckoning, it will hopefully not be about breaking from the past, but about breaking from the habit of its disavowal. If this project of remembrance requires leaving the country, then so be it because it is not an escape. We will find our country everywhere, among the city streets and town squares and empty fields of the world, where we may also discover that the possibility of redemption is not because of our own God-given beneficence, but proof of the world's unending generosity. There's a real sense throughout her book of this idea of American exceptionalism that she just punctures when we start to see all the different things that we've done um, from the Cold War to the present day. So if you're interested in world politics, if you're interested in the Middle East, if you're interested in trying to understand more about the, the Muslim world, um, this is definitely one for you. I think it was a finalist for the uh, recent Pulitzer Prize. Uh, not an easy read, not a fun read, but certainly an eye-opening read. 
And my final book for the week was this month's selection in my classic uh, book club, and that was For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. It's a reread for me. I read it a couple years ago, and I've read it probably five times over the, the course of my adult life. Um, Hemingway went to Spain uh, as a journalist in 1937 and was there witnessing the Civil War in Spain. And then three years later, this book came out, which some feel is perhaps one of the greatest war books of all time. It's about uh, a young American teacher of Spanish at the University of Montana, Robert Jordan, who is now working in the resistance, in the partisans uh, in Spain as a demolitions expert. He had had some training in that and became a dynamiter where he would blow up trains or this current mission of his is to blow up a bridge at the beginning of an attack by the Republic. And the whole book is really his meeting this group of partisans, his preparations for his mission to blow the bridge, all the problems they have, all the successes they have, all the joys they have. He meets a woman and there's a romantic interest. And it's, it's just basically Robert Jordan's journey. And at times it is absolutely spellbinding. I'm not gonna say much more about it now because I'll have a full video of this coming out the last Sunday of November. So if you've read it or you're about to read it, I won't ruin anything else about it. I'll just let you know that my video on this will be coming out later this month. So that's what I read this week. Um, I think that pushes me to 108 books this year, which is the most I've ever read in a single year. I very rarely get above 75 books a year when I was teaching. I just didn't have time. Um, but now that I'm not teaching, I'm reading two or three books a week and getting a lot of reading done. Um, I have a lot to choose from uh, in the next couple of weeks. And I'm not sure if I'm going to keep reading on the dark side, as I've been calling it, reading three at a time. I think what I might do is I'm still going to split up the pages I read in any given day, but I still might, I might try to go back to reading one at a time for a little while and see if I notice an appreciable dis, uh, difference in terms of retention or understanding or continuity. Uh, I can always go back to reading three at a time. That worked out much better than I ever thought it would. Um, so it's just kind of a, an experiment. So I have five books that I just picked up yesterday or the day before from the library. So I have them for the next three weeks. And those are uh, Lake Success by Gary Steingart, uh, Bridge of Clay by Marcus Zusak, which I see is not getting the, the greatest reviews here on BookTube, French Exit by Patrick DeWitt, Bitter Orange by Claire Fuller. This is one that Jacqueline told me that she adored. And then I'll be doing a buddy read at some point in the next couple of weeks with Jacqueline of The Clockmaker's Daughter by Kate Morton. I also need to reread Zadie Smith's White Teeth for a book club by the end of the month. And the next book in my series on death is James Agee's novel from, I think it's 1957, A Death in the Family. And so I'll be picking that up at some point. I don't know exactly when. And I recently bought five or six paperback books that I want to get to um, that I bought from Amazon. And so my TBR just keeps expanding. I have fallen into, it's not really a bad trap, but I have fallen into the trap of putting a lot of books on reserve at the library. And then because... I only have a couple of weeks to read them. They become my priority on my TBR list, and I'm reading a lot of new releases because of that, which is both good and bad. Uh, the downside of that is I'm not reading much other than the new releases because there's so many of them that have come in at one time. I started to learn how to massage the system a little bit and put some of my reserves on suspension if I've got too many facing me so they don't all come in at one time, but th they still seem to... to clump up and come together. Um, okay, that's ab about it for me. Uh, it's a sunny day for a change. We have had one of the wettest weeks I can remember, uh, but today it's cold or cool and sunny. I may try to go for a bike ride today, or if not today, certainly tomorrow before the rain starts again. Uh, I hope you have wonderful plans for the weekend, uh, and I'll talk to you again early next week. Bye, everybody.